Hi, I'm Abe Socher, editor of the Jewish Review of Books, the quarterly magazine of Jewish criticism, essays, and ideas. Welcome to JRB Conversations. Tonight, for Yom Atzmut, Israel's Independence Day, I'll be speaking with my friend, the great historian Yehuda Reinhardt, about Chaim Weizmann, who was not only a distinguished chemist, founder of the Weizmann Institute, and Israel's first president, but for decades before that, Zionist, the Zionist Project's indispensable man. Without Weizmann, Reinhardt argues, no Israel. The British philosopher Isaiah Berlin, who knew Weizmann a little earlier in his later years, <clears throat> a little in his later years, I should say, said that Weizmann managed to create the strange illusion among statesmen of the world that he was himself a world statesman representing a movement in exile by the sheer force of his conviction. Ministers were known to shrink nervously from his visits because they feared the interview might prove altogether too much of a moral experience. In his three volume biography of Weizmann, the last volume just came out in Hebrew and is now being translated into English, Professor Reinhardt recreates the remarkable, daunting, often exhausting experience of meeting Chaim Weizmann. Reinhardt is, like Weizmann, a distinguished academic. He's the Richard Corp Professor of Modern Jewish History and the director of the Tauber Institute at Brandeis University. In addition to his big decades in the making biography of Weizmann, he is the author, co-author, or editor of, I don't know, by my count, more than two dozen other books which deeply explore various aspects of the modern Jewish experience in Europe and Israel, not to speak of his book um, on the figure of the donkey in Western literature, which is actually quite good. If you have taken or teach a course in modern Jewish history, you've probably read the documentary history put together with Paul Mendes for the Jew in the modern world. But like his subject, Yehuda is more than an academic. He operates outside the seminar room. For an extraordinary 17 years, he was the president of Brandeis University. And for the last decade, he's been president of the Mandel Foundation, one of the world's leading nonprofits, which does an enormous amount to enrich Jewish, civic, and intellectual life in Israel and America. And in particular, as it happens, where I am here in Cleveland. Welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, before we turn to Weizmann, I have a quick question for you. Um, you grew up in Haifa in the 50s. Um, what was Yom Ha'atzmaut like then? Well, if I think of Yom Ha'atzmaut in Haifa in the 50s, uh, it brings back uh, two, two memories. One, uh, from the age of nine or 10, and this was the time when uh, kids were unsupervised by mm -hmm. their parents. Uh, my classmates, people from my neighborhood, I lived in the lower part of Haifa. Uh, we would all um, go down to the uh, main street, Herzl Street, uh, and uh, usually with Israeli flags and uh, create a lot of noise. And usually it was a lot of dancing, uh, sometimes with the parade. Mm. Uh, so that was one. The second one, uh, which doesn't bring <laughs> the best memories is that I was uh, from the age of 11, I think, 11 or 12, I was a member of a youth marching band. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I played the tuba and I had to march with the tuba, which is a pretty heavy instrument, uh, the entire length of Herzl Street, which uh, was not something that I <laughs> perfectly enjoyed. But, uh, but it, was, um, it was a lot of, uh, you know, happy times and, um, and uh, uh, brings back good memories. So uh, 15 or 20 years after the tuba playing, I think, uh, I'm guessing, um, you, uh, you started to study uh, Chaim Weizmann. Um, how did that come about? By total accident. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I were in uh, Israel in 73, summer of 73. I was already a professor at uh, the University of Michigan. And after one year of teaching at Michigan, I told the chairman of the department that I had to uh, enlist in the Israeli army. I had to serve in the Israeli army. Uh, he thought I was completely crazy, but uh, that's what I did. Uh, I um, went to the induction center and uh, this was probably one of the low points in my life. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, officer in charge said, how old are you? I was 29. He said, you're much too old, go home. And um, so I did uh, crestfallen. And there, the question was, what, what am I gonna do with myself? And uh, because too I came late, to Israel for the to year- back to Michigan. No, no, that was not, you know, I would have been embarrassed to come back. So, um, and uh, a cousin of mine who was on the board of the Weizmann Institute uh, uh, told me that um, the 23 volumes of the letters were being edited. Would I like to edit one of them? Uh, the letters of Weizmann. Mm. And that's how I got involved with Weizmann. I edited volume nine, and uh, which deals with the period right after the end of World War I. And that was the beginning. Wow. So 73, and now it's uh, 2021. Um, yeah, well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved with Weizmann all the time. All the time. <laughs> you were doing other things. I was doing other things. But um, in between, I uh, collected materials, uh, published those uh, earlier two volumes. And the third volume, actually, together with my colleague, uh, Moti Golani, uh, from uh, Tel Aviv University, uh, we co-authored uh, the third mm -hmm. volume that just came out. Right. And um, well, back to the letters. W what, uh, what kind of letter writer was he? He was a person who could uh, write 25, 30 letters a day, um, uh, day after day. Uh, he was really the original uh, Facebook or whatever uh, these uh, social media are now called. Right. Um, uh, he was a one man uh, 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 social uh, or Facebook uh, <laughs> uh, person who wrote letters. And you know, in London in those days, um, particularly in London, uh, letters were, uh, if you sent a letter to somebody at 10, before 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you got actually a reply that same day from that uh, person. Um, a mail was, pay, was uh, collected a couple of times a day, sometimes three times a day. And so um, that was really his way of uh, staying in touch, uh, controlling the information mm -hmm. and uh, knowing what's going on in every, every part of the movement. Um, and uh, when, you, well, when you were reading the letters, you'd, you'd probably read his, I'm sure you, you had read uh, his um, very charming biography that he wrote with, with the great writer Maurice Samuels. Um, did the did the biography match up with the letters? Well, this uh, autobiography, actually, the autobiography, uh, which he started writing in the '30s, and then finished it with uh, Samuel, as you exactly. mentioned. Um, uh, I read it, of course, like uh, many many young people in at my time in in Israel, um, uh, trial and error, um, and uh, read it a couple of times since then. Uh, it's probably one of the uh, best written. Uh, autobiographies of Zionists that uh, uh, I can think of. And um, um, when I actually started to do the work on, um, on the biography, um, it turns out that uh, much of it is not quite true. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, people write their memories, they want them uh, shaped in a certain way. And uh, Weizmann was a master at that, and uh, Samuel even more so. so um, uh, it's very well written, but some uh, egregious uh, changes that were made that don't quite uh, uh, fit that history. What, what's, uh, can you think of one example of, of one of those egregious changes? I'll give you one example. When the uh, Kishinev uh, pogroms um, uh, took place in, uh, in uh, 1903, mm. uh, Weizmann was in his lab in, uh, in uh, Switzerland at the time. And uh, subsequent to the pogroms, he wrote a, uh, he wrote a letter to uh, someone and um, said, um, uh, when I heard about the pogroms, I, um, I uh, went to, uh, I went to Kishinev, took the first uh, means of getting to Kishinev I organized the um, defenders, the Jew defenders of the Jews. Uh, we beat them back and, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, that was sort of curious uh, for me. So uh, I looked into it and uh, I was wondering how can somebody get away with it? Because I knew Weizmann was in his lab. He was not in Kishinev. Well, it turns out there was another Weizmann 
who was uh, present and actually did what Weizmann uh, claimed he did. That was his brother, uh, Moshe Weizmann. And um, Weizmann apparently thought he could get away with it. He repeats that story many times in the period before World War I. And um, so that's one example. Uh, clearly, he was embarrassed, ashamed, uh, whatever, of not actually having done what his brother did. And mm -hmm. uh, this is, that's the result. And many such, you know, some are inadvertent, some are, uh, you know, clearly uh, not true. Uh, but uh, as he grew older, he probably believed them. Let's go back to the beginning of his career, or rather his two careers, right? Because he's a uh, very successful biochemist and a more successful Zionist, I guess we could we could say. So um, he's born in the Russian Pale of Su Settlement in little town in 1874. Um, uh, it's, uh, even though to a relatively enlightened family, it's, it, it's not clear that one could become either of those things born in those circumstances so how how does it how does it happen it's even more remarkable than that um his mother gave birth to 15 children three died at infancy or shortly after it mm. of the 12 11 attended university wow only one did not uh he grew up in a home where boys his father, and girls pardon me boys and girls boys and girls um, he grew up in a home. Uh, his father was a, uh, a masculine, an enlightened Jew, um, received newspapers uh, on a regular basis from various parts of the empire. And, uh, um, and education was very important and constantly hammered in. And Weizmann was ambitious. So, uh, but so were his uh, siblings. Weizmann also made sure, uh, much to the chagrin of his wife in later years, of supporting all of his brothers and sisters uh, while they attended uh, universities. Uh, was very important to him too, to make sure that they got an education. And uh, in general, he supported his family until uh, uh, quite late in life. Um, so if I recall correct, I mean, it's amazing the span of his career, right? But if I recall correctly, he doesn't quite make it to the first Zionist co Congress, but he almost does, right? That's he's, correct. He's trying to make some... He wants to make a deal. Right. He wants to make a deal because Weizmann as a uh, biochemist was very interested from the very beginning in selling his patents. Right. He uh, needed money, needed money badly. Uh, he was always uh, short of money. Uh, early on, he received money from his uh, father, who also didn't have a lot of money to give away. And uh, he was very eager to sell his patents, so many patents in his name. And uh, most of them didn't come to uh, much, but some brought in some money. And but at that, point, that's, he's just, he's so just... he went to Russia in order to sell one, and he came too late for the Congress. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. But at this point, he's just like 23, 24 or something. That's like correct. That. That's correct. But he's already got, he's got a patent to sell. Um, but he's at the second Zionist Congress and, and then thereafter, of course, and early on, he's, he's an opponent of, of Herzl, uh, the leader or a leader of the democratic faction. Right. What, what's his problem with Herzl? <laughs> Many problems. Um, by the way, in, in, I, before I forget to say that, later on in life, not that much later, he actually compares himself to Herzl. He sort of sees himself as, a, uh, as somebody who continues his legacy. But in the early period, I mean, it really comes, um, uh, uh, the conflict between them. Weizmann as a leader of the democratic fraction, it's, which was a group of uh, young intellectuals like him, like himself, uh, opposed Herzl's uh, scheme to uh, have a, what he called a Nachtasil, a, a temporary, um, a place to, uh, to uh, escape uh, in what was really um, uh, East Africa, Uganda, mm -hmm. and uh, called the Uganda um, right. uh, Project. And uh, that's where the conflict uh, came. At the same time, he was a great admirer of Herzl as well, and had many similar characteristics. Uh, uh, later on, it, it was quite clear. They both used their professions 
to advance Zionism. Uh, they both like to lead a movement without any, um, any uh, consultation with other, other people in the movement. And even when they got instructions as to what to do, most of the time they ignored them. Uh, they were loners um, and quite autocratic actually in the way they behaved themselves. So uh, uh, he learned a lot from Herzl and, uh, and actually admired him as well. In addition to the criticism, there was great admiration. And I, this time, the early 20th century, there's so much Jewish ideological ferment, so much going on um, in your in your first book, the first the first volume of the Weizmann book. You talk about these marathon debates Weizmann would have um, with representatives of the Jewish Bund, but even with Plekhanov, the leading Russian Marxist, like a three-day um, uh, debate. W what was what was the intellectual scene? How were they conducted? Who's listening to these debates? And was that part of him becoming a leader? Yes, leading the um, the democratic fraction was the beginning, really, of um, his. Um, his ability to think of himself as a leader. Uh, it was his idea. It was not easy. Everybody wanted to be a leader in those, uh, in those groups. And um, uh, these people, men and women, by the way, when they were not uh, at the university, they uh, congregated in coffee houses. Uh, the Zionists in one coffee, particular coffee house, the Bundists in another one, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they would arrange debates. Now, who listened to the debates? They listened to the debates, to each other. Yeah. And those debates you know, could take uh, place uh, beginning in the evening, going on throughout the night. Um, it was customary to uh, speak uh, for uh, two, three hours. That was considered to be sort of an average, um, an average uh, speech. And, um, and so they went at it. And uh, day after day after day, how they had the ability to do this, I don't know. But sometimes they met in the uh, in uh, wooded areas. They also had to watch out for the police, which uh, usually looked after them. And um, and Weizmann really developed his uh, leadership skills there. Actually, he started already in Pinsk, where he went to he finished his high school uh, mm -hmm. years. He already began to be involved in leadership roles. But in uh, Germany, subsequently in Switzerland, uh, that was really honed. And the democratic faction made uh, quite a bit of noise uh, around itself. That was one uh, area that, um, uh, that interested him. The other one was that uh, the big debate in the Congresses in those, uh, in those early years was whether they would also deal with what they called Gegenwartsarbeit, which meant really dealing with issues of, uh, of scholarship, uh, of, uh, of, if you like, um, uh, what we would call today uh, humanities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what, what was the future land going to look like? What kind of a culture would it have? And that's when uh, Martin Buber created his uh, famous journal called The Jude, and where Weizmann uh, hedged together with Buber and another person, Bertolt Feivel, the idea of a Hebrew university in Jerusalem. That was the origin of the Hebrew university. Wow. Wow. He also had a role in Technion, not to speak in- He also, he also had a role Spain. in the Technion, but less than the Hebrew University. Uh -huh. um, by the way, um, speaking of coffee houses, is it true he met Lenin in the Swiss cafe? There's, uh, there's some indication that he met uh, Lenin. I could not prove it. However, um, Weizmann had in his library a volume of Lenin's writings with a dedication from Lenin. Uh -huh. So the question is, um, you know, did Lenin give it to him? Did he get it from somebody else? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, when he became president of uh, the state of uh, Israel, he was invited at some point to the uh, Russian consulate or embassy, and he actually gave them the volume as a present. Uh, oh. Big mistake, but uh, <clears throat> would be worth a lot of money today. So, uh, but, uh, so we don't really know for sure if, uh, if this is true or not. Um, as of course, they look they look the same. That's true, right? The the um, the bald head, this at least in the pictures, the kind of austere, uh, severe stare. Um, 
he has a couple of siblings who stay in Russia, right? One, um, uh, Shmuel, uh, one of his brothers. Um, and uh, Weizmann writes about the uh, fierce debates at the home on, uh, uh, on issues of socialism and uh, Zionism and uh, must've been quite a household. And, um, <clears throat> and he ended up uh, going to, uh, to Russia and um, never came back. They, um, they could not find a trace of him. Hmm. Um, now back to uh, the young chemist in, in Switzerland. So he's, I don't know, he's got these patents, but I have to imagine he's still a sort of obscure, a, at least in non-Zionist circles, an obscure chemistry, a, a guy with a doctorate in chemistry. How does he, how does he get to Manchester University? He was, um, uh, he felt, um, I would say, oppressed to some degree in, um, in uh, Germany as well as in Switzerland by, the, uh, by his Russian elders. Uh, they actually, people like Chlenov um, and, uh, and others, they actually, uh, Sishkin of course, they, um, they really um, had um, the most say in how the opponents to, to Herzl and then to, uh, uh, to others uh, in the movement, how they would conduct themselves, what they would uh, say, how they would vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that was only one thing. The other one that he saw no uh, future for uh, his career as a chemist in Switzerland. And, uh, and that's why he made the decision. He had already been to England once before uh, at the fourth Zionist Congress. And he decides that uh, he's gonna apply for jobs in England and he got a job in uh, Manchester uh, as a very, very lowly, um, uh, actually somebody works in a, in a lab uh, and assists professors. Uh, that was a job as well as then uh, teaching now. Mm -hmm. Uh, his English is very poor at uh, that time. Uh, he takes him a lot of time to prepare lectures, but uh, apparently he was well liked. We know this from a testimony I found from his former students in the archives of the, of the University of Manchester. So, um, uh, and he finally rises in the, um, in the ranks. Uh, eventually, the biggest disappointment in Weizmann's life is that he never achieved a professorship at the University of Manchester. He became a reader, which is a tenured position. We would call it today an associate professor. Right. But, um, but he did not make it as a professor. That had a lot of uh, politics around it. It had a lot of jealousy and, and all, all the good things that happened at universities. <laughs> and um, so he experienced it uh, early on. Also, he was involved in a, um, in a kind of chemistry that was not a very popular chemistry at the time. Uh, he was involved in biotechnology, which uh, was not something that was uh, highly regarded at uh, universities. Of course, made his career later on, but um, early on that, uh, uh, that was not something that was sufficiently respected. By the way, we have all the tenure uh, files on uh, Weizmann. I know what, uh, what people wrote about him and um, actually said some nice things about him, uh, but that's another story. And um, it, well, the, his, his biotechnology, as you say, at later makes his, his career um, uh, when, he's, when he's working with acetone, and which turns out to be important for the war effort. You, I don't understand how, but I mean, maybe you, I'm sure you do. Um, how is that connected with his great success? I don't know if you consider it his greatest success, but his most famous success is of course, the issuing of the, of the Balfour uh, Declaration, his, his part in that. Is uh, that the, tied to his, his war work? Are you asking me, did his chemistry um, have, a, have a role in it? What, what are you asking me actually? The, the fact that he becomes, uh, as I understand it, uh, some, a crucial figure and something of a hero in, in Great Britain because of his chemical breakthroughs and their, their help in the war effort, is that one of the things 
that brings him into these diplomatic circles where he can affect this? Yeah, without doubt. I mean, um, Weizmann had a uh, um, had a special talent to uh, meet people uh, and to talk to them. He talked Zionism nonstop. Uh, anytime he could get away from the lab, uh, he met people in England. He actually became a vice uh, president of the English Zionist Federation, which was a non non job. He also was free of the Russian, um, you know, old guard. So mm -hmm. he was independent. And as an independent person, Weizmann, just like Herzl before him, uh, did what he wanted to do and uh, charted his own course in Zionist history. Uh, he meets um, uh, at one of uh, one uh, tea party, he meets um, a very important person by the name of C.P. Scott, who was editor of the Manchester, of the Manchester Guardian. Um, and uh, C.P. Scott uh, takes to him. And, um, and so you have, to, you have to imagine the following. Here's a guy, uh, here's a person who uh, is a um, minor academic, um, has no money, he's always hard for money. His wife stopped working. And uh, he, um, he says to himself that if somebody will pay his trips to uh, go to London from Manchester, he could persuade the greatest empire in the world. I mean, Great Britain um, was uh, really uh, occupied, uh, controlled one third of the world. And he could, he could uh, persuade the British politicians that uh, they should give the Zionists a charter. I mean, there's no, nothing in the world that could have persuaded him or persuaded anybody that he could do it. But he sets his mind to it. And C.P. Scott helps him, helps him by introducing him to uh, politicians as he goes to, to London. Uh, he meets on the way, he meets Balfour early on. He meets Churchill early on. I mean, all these people are running for elections. So they want to meet uh, people who uh, play a role in the Jewish community. So here is Weizmann. And, um, uh, but certainly the fact that he helped England out in a critical period in, um, uh, in the war by producing synthetic acetone, which no other chemist in uh, England was able to do, in Great Britain was able to do. Um, certainly uh, that, was a, um, that was a discovery, a, a patent that he gave free of charge to the British um, and was very important for the war effort. Uh, it's, by the way, acetone, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on acetone, but uh, acetone helps make uh, gunpowder smokeless. Very important to, uh, to make sure that the uh, enemy does not know where the guns are located. Ah. And um, uh, it's much more complicated than that, but he's the only one able to do this and he's known in, uh, in England, uh, way into the 30s, as the guy who helped England during a critical period. Now, of course, memory fades off after a while, but I'll just mention one curiosity. Uh, it is so well known that in 1936, I discovered a play that George Bernard Shaw uh, wrote, uh, was really not known beforehand. And it's a play about Weizmann. Uh, he writes it in 1936. Shaw uh, Pardon me? Uh, I just saying George Bernard Shaw does. Yeah, and um, and it's called Arthur and the Acetone, um, and it's a um, it's a three act play that uh, that uh, uh, pretends to uh, to recreate the meeting between Balfour and uh, Weizmann. Balfour asks him for um, for the patent for acetone. Um, uh, you know, first they look all over England, they can't find anybody. Somebody says, is this Jew? Uh, go get him. Uh, and it, in, and the, the uh, lieutenant there says, well, he's a Jew. You can't, you know, can't bring a Jew here. And Balfour says, well, is uh, acetone a Jew, uh, a Jewish? Or, you know, and so on and goes. Now, Balfour, uh, ba not Balfour, uh, C.P. Uh, Shaw. Uh, Scott um, Shaw uh, yeah. was a well-known anti-Semite, right? And so uh, at the end in, in act two, if you don't mind, I'll read you this one, one excerpt. I would love it. And he says, gotta get my glasses here. He says, uh, he writes, um, Arthur, this, this means Arthur Balfour, Dr. Weizmann, we must have the mic this microbe uh, at, at your own price, name it. 
uh, we shall not hesitate at six figures. Um, Weizmann answers, I do not ask for money. Arthur, there must be some misunderstanding. I was informed that you are a Jew. Weizmann, you were informed correctly. I am a Jew. Arthur, but pardon me, you said you do not ask for money. Weizmann, precisely. I do not want any money. Arthur, a title perhaps, Baron, Lord, don't hesitate. Weizmann, nothing would induce me to accept a title. If I would have a, if I would accept a title, I would have to pay more for everything. Arthur, then may I ask without offense, since you want none of the things that everybody else wants, what the hell do you want? Weizmann, I want Jerusalem. Arthur, it's yours. I only regret that we cannot throw in Madagascar as well. Unfortunately, it belongs to the French government. The Holy Land belongs naturally to the Church of England and to it, you are most welcome. And now will you be so good as to hand over the microbe? So, um, you know, why, why is this important? George Bernard Shaw could write such a play because he knew everybody, everybody in England would know what this is about. So you have to think to yourself, uh, you're talking about the impact of the Balfour. Uh, it's a Balfour letter, not a declaration. I'll explain right. it in a minute. You, you have to ask yourself, um, you know, what's the impact after a while? And um, Weizmann is called in the British papers, he is called Weizmann the Great. Weizmann the Great. The British papers write about him as the kind of a guy who is able to, um, to turn the heads of the British politicians and do with them as he wants, as he wishes. Uh, and to a great extent, this is true. Now it's the Balfour Declaration is not a declaration, it's a letter. I just wanna make clear, it's a letter. The same kind of a letter was written to Armenians, to Arabs, to Kurds. Uh, Weizmann made it a declaration. And he used the word declaration, uh, which eventually the British adopted. But, but there's, uh, just to bring this out, I mean, you, you were saying this, but there's an anti, there's, there's an anti-Semitic argument in Shaw and in, and in the implication that uh, Weizmann is the kind of person who can manipulate politicians as opposed to, well, to take, um, to take what uh, Isaiah Berlin was saying, you know, the moral force of his argument and his character to convince them. Uh, Shaw seems to make it in that, that, that uh, you know, just a quid pro quo, uh, you know, um, his, uh, his pound of flesh or something like that. Um, but I take it that, that you think he actually, he convinced these Lloyd George and Arthur Balfour and all these people of the justness of his cause, or do you? I will, you know, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> I've been working on Weizmann for, you know, off and on for decades. Um, and um, I'm often asked, what is the secret? What, what's, what's his ability to get the uh, British to do what he wants? I mean, here's a guy without an army without uh, the Zionist movement behind him, without the Jewish people behind him. And he appears and he, so said, and he says so. He writes to Churchill in 1921. He says, you know, uh, my constituency uh, is, goes all the way from, uh, from Madagascar to, to uh, San Francisco. Now, I mean, there's nothing to it, um, but Weizmann also, uh, plays on, um, not openly, not, uh, not in so many words, but he plays on anti-Semitism. In other words, the notion is, is abroad that the Zionists, in fact, or the Jews, in fact, control the world. I mean, they look around the world, um, Brandeis in, on the Supreme Court, um, they look to Russia, they see all these Jews in, in the uh, government in the early years after the war, uh, and on and on, and they see the Rothschilds, and there's this notion. And um, that's one thing. The other one is that, um, uh, which you can't explain. I have not been able to explain it. 
why is why does Weizmann have that power over people? Now, uh, he he was an impressive looking guy. He was six foot tall, unusual for Jews uh, at the time, anyhow. Uh, immaculately dressed, uh, became very rich after World War One, uh, from a byproduct of acetone. Uh, it's a whole other story. And uh, he lives like the British. He is a Zionist uh, with uh, every ounce of his uh, body, but he's also British. And he talks like them. He behaves like them. He tells them jokes about Jews. They've never met a Jew like this. And he's very proud of his Jewishness. Uh, so, uh, and I'll give you one example. Uh, he comes back from uh, the United States in uh, 1921 um, because he, he went, he goes to, uh, to uh, the United States in 1921 to go to the Cleveland Convention, right where you are. Yeah. And uh, actually in a synagogue that you know very well. And he's able to defeat Louis Brandeis on his home turf. And as he finishes, he hears that Herbert Samuel who was the first commissioner for Palestine uh, is uh, making all kinds of noises uh, with the Bedouins, uh, to the Bedouins, uh, promising some kinds of land in what was called the entrenched Jordan. Weizmann takes the first boat home and he comes in the afternoon uh, in uh, June. The first call he makes to his home, to Balfour, he says, uh, Mr. Balfour, we have, by the way, the protocol. Uh, Mr. Balfour, tomorrow morning, I'd like a new house. He says to Balfour, a new house, I'd like to see you the prime minister. I also want to see Churchill, who is the minister for the colonies. I also want to see Mr. Henke, who is the uh, who is the secretary to the parliament. I want all of you to be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. They all show up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And Weizmann does something that no one would dare do. In front of Churchill, Churchill is the minister of the colonies, so he's the boss of Samuel, who is in Palestine. He takes on, on Samuel uh, in no uncertain terms, tells Churchill what he thinks of him, et cetera. And Churchill, uh, and Lloyd George says to Churchill, is what he says true? And Churchill says, yes, it's true. So, and Churchill says, uh, listen, I understand that you do, uh, that you guys, the, the Haganah was already uh, operating in Palestine. Uh, he said, I know that you're gun running. He says, go ahead and do it. And Weizmann said, it's against the law. He says, well, I'm the law. I'm telling you, go do it. Just don't tell anybody. I mean, he's trying to appease Weizmann. Now this scene uh, appears a number of times in the 1920s and 1930s. And I don't have an explanation what gives him this kind of, uh, of power, um, except for another incident that takes place in 1930, but maybe we'll get to it. And compare him to other Zionist leaders at this time. Does any, I mean, Brandeis obviously has in America um, power, can speak to presidents. Is, is there anybody else who has this, who, who, who can speak as an equal to leaders of, uh, of states? Weizmann spoke, met every American president from Wilson on, with the exception of Hoover, because Hoover was not, not in Washington when he came every American president. And uh, he met Truman five times. Um, and um, and he, he met Mussolini four times. We met the King of uh, Italy, uh, the King of uh, England, of course, cardinals, uh, the uh, heads of state in France, in Germany, in Holland. Um, you ask yourself, where is this coming from? It's the, same, uh, it's the same phenomenon that I can't fully explain. I don't know that anybody can, um, but uh, it is this image of Weizmann as a, uh, as a world leader, um, not a leader on behalf of England, a world leader. And um, um, this, this power, um, is this uh, imagined power is with him until actually 1947, 48. And um, well, I'm tempted to jump ahead because one of those famous meetings is is with Truman before the UN. That, well, maybe we'll just do it. Uh, how important is he to to 
Truman deciding uh, to uh, to vote for Israel in, in the UN. You know, people sometimes ask me, uh, what did he say to Truman that was so, uh, that convinced Truman? It's not what he said, it's how he said it. Um, having met every American president uh, prior to him and lots and lots of heads of states, he was not particularly awed by Truman. I mean, he was respectful. Um, he was not particularly diplomatic. In the second meeting that he meets uh, Truman, by the way, he was always uh, brought, brought through a side door. Why side door? Because Truman was sick of the Zionists. And he said, I don't wanna meet any Zionists anymore. And they, they persuade him, uh, it's before Jacobson, they persuade him, you know, go see this uh, person, et cetera, he's this mm -hmm. and that. And so he comes to a side door. And second meeting, you know, he, he talks to Truman and all of a sudden he does something that nobody ever does. He pulls out a map from his pocket, puts <laughs> it on the table and says to Truman, well, why don't we look at the map? You'll see what, uh, what I have in mind. <laughs> Truman is so taken aback he goes and does exactly what Weizmann tells him. He goes and takes a look at that map. And Weizmann says, this is where we are. This is where the Arabs are. This is what we need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, in a final analysis, although Truman was still reluctant to see him too often, Weizmann always managed to get in uh, with the famous uh, story about Jacobson who persuades him to, uh, right. to see him at uh, one critical per period. But you have to understand something, without Weizmann, the state of Israel would not have had at that time, the Negev, which uh, Truman, which Weizmann explained to Truman why the Negev is so important. And by the way, you, have, you know, of course, that the State Department was completely opposed to any of this and to the uh, declaration of a state uh, of the state of Israel and uh, was able to get from Truman a loan for hundred million dollars. Now that's a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money today. It was real money right. in 1947-48. Um, so uh, once again, his, the combination of his charm, of his appearance as a proud Jew speaking on behalf of the Jewish people worldwide um, persuaded Truman. And Truman made it clear that uh, he would have faith only in Weizmann as the president of Israel. Now, Truman at the time thought that president is like president of, of uh, the United States. Uh, but why Weizmann? Because he knew Weizmann was uh, pro-Western. And, and there was a great deal of fear in the State Department that uh, the uh, state of Israel might in fact um, uh, uh, play really with the Soviet bloc, the, the Russian right. bloc at that time. Ben-Gurion would. Right. Um, well, he doesn't move to to Palestine, to British Mandate Palestine, till the till the mid '30s. Did he consider moving earlier? What about the? Why not in the '20s? You know, there were periods when Weizmann was uh, disgusted, disappointed, uh, uh, whatever, um, and he would make noises about moving to um, to um, Palestine, to Israel. Uh, Vera, his wife, would have none of this. And he wasn't really serious. I mean, um, he was serious in the uh, late 20s uh, and early 30s about uh, teaching at the Hebrew University. Now, here you have a, a person who uh, actually is responsible more than anybody else for the creation of, of the Hebrew University. But uh, the president of, uh, uh, the real president of the, um, uh, of the Hebrew University would have none of it. Judah Magnus. Judah Magnus. Uh, they were to on totally opposite sides. Uh -huh. uh, Weizmann, uh, Weizmann and uh, Albert Einstein couldn't stand uh, the, uh, <laughs> this American rabbi and who wanted actually to um, emphasize the humanities, uh, Jewish studies, uh, humanities in general, uh, as a teaching and wanted a teaching institution at the Hebrew University. They wanted, of course, science. And Weizmann tried with all his might to, uh, to persuade uh, Magnus to let him uh, teach, etc. cetera. Uh, I maintain that part of the creation of the Zeef Institute, which is a precursor to the Weizmann Institute, uh, was because Weizmann decided he's gonna create his own institution and uh, which eventually became the Weizmann Institute. 
and um, so he doesn't he doesn't go in the twenties. Um, what's his reaction to the to the terrible uh, riots of the late of the late twenties, the nineteen twenty nine riots? Well, the um, the riots in uh, nineteen twenty nine followed the previous riots, of course, and the British always did when a riot occurred in Palestine the same thing. Uh, they sent a delegation to investigate. Uh, there was a report, and then they would, um, already by the 1920s, uh, and certainly the late 1920s, they began to have cold feet, cold feet uh, about the Balfour Declaration. We should say, by the way, I, I shorthand, the Arab anti-Jewish riots of-, of Correct, America. yes. Uh, I forget sometimes. <laughs> so um, the- um, uh, so this, uh, the, the, in 1929, of course, there were anti-Jewish riots um, that had to do with, uh, uh, with the Western Wall. And, um, um, and the story of that is not really important here, but a commission went, came back, and uh, Lord Passfield, who was then the minister for the colonies, uh, issues a white paper. Uh, the white paper in 1930, October of 1930, uh, is very damning. It uh, actually is, a, uh, uh, is the beginning of a real transition in British policy that uh, talks about uh, equal opportunities for the Palestinian Arabs and for the Jews, et cetera. At that point, only 17% of the population of Palestine are, are in fact Jews. Hmm. And uh, Weizmann goes to the uh, prime minister, Ramsey MacDonald, and he says to him, uh, by the way, he doesn't knock on the door. He just walks in. And MacDonald uh, is not a friend of-, of No, Ramsey MacDonald was actually um, quite friendly, ah. but weak. Uh, this, uh, you know, this was, uh, Ramsey MacDonald was part of the Labor Party. Labor Party was inexperienced. Uh, they had not been in, in, uh, in uh, control for quite some time. Ramsey MacDonald was, um, uh, was not very popular. And Weizmann says to him, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm gonna quit as the president of the World Zionist Organization. Now, you would think that uh, if somebody says this to the Prime Minister, somebody says, uh, have a good life, goodbye. <laughs> Ramsey MacDonald is, uh, is worried terribly because he knows that Weizmann is in close touch with members of, leading members of his own party and of the opposition parties. And if Weizmann wants to, he can topple the government. Really? And Weizmann plays this to the end. And Ramsey MacDonald is so uh, scared. I think that's the right word, actually. He says to him, okay, we'll have uh, another committee. Who do you want on the committee? And he says, well, I want Henderson. You know, it's, uh, he doesn't have to explain to Ramsey MacDonald that Henderson is, is uh, favorably disposed to the Zionists. Okay, who do you want on the committee? He tells him. Who... They come back with another uh, with another um, declaration. It's not yet a white paper. In February of 1931, in February of 1931, okay, October is is the Passfield white paper. Ramsey McDonald uh, changes changes all of that in February. He changes the white paper. He takes it off the table. In the entire history of England, of Great Britain, it's never happened before and never happened since that a private citizen could come and change a white paper. It never happened. And, um, and uh, Weizmann says, um, okay, but I want a letter to this. He says, but this time, I don't want a letter to Rothschild. You know, the Balfour letter was written to Rothschild, not to Weizmann. He said, the letter is going to be written to me. This is really what we call in our book, it's the McDonald Weizmann Declaration. I'll tell you why this is important. That particular declaration allowed in the 1930s, refugees from Central Europe and elsewhere to come to Palestine in droves. And from 17%, the Yishuv, the Jewish community in Palestine grew to almost 40%. They became 400,000 strong. That was the beginning of the Jewish state. Not what happened after 46, of course, of that, what happened after 46, 7, of course, was important. But it was the beginning of a mass 
of highly educated, uh, experienced, not everybody, obviously, uh, people thrown out of their own countries who came and built the institutions or continue to build the institutions of the Jewish state. Uh, had it not been, I maintain, or we maintain, there would be no Jewish state. Wow. So he get, so it's only shortly thereafter that he does go to go to Palestine. No, he's been to Palestine all along. No, no, no. I mean, he moves. He moves to Palestine. And well, no, no, he does. He never really moves to Palestine. He built a house. Oh. He built a house in Rehovot, a uh, very expensive house that still stands on the campus of the Weizmann Institute. Um, was called the Armon, the, the palace, um, it was at the time. And, um, they, and he and Vera come for periods of time. Uh, I don't think he's ever been to, to, uh, to uh, Israel at the time for more than five months at a time. Ah. And um, he does not feel completely comfortable. You know, we, we, we tend to have a, a Palestino-centric or Israeli-centric view that everything happened in, in Israel. It happened from outside of Israel. It happened in London, it happened in America. Uh, uh, the state was not born because of what happened uh, in Israel. Of course, that played a role as well, but the major decisions were made elsewhere. So I have, um, this has um, been so fun, I lost track of time. I have a, a last, question for you and then we have a lot of questions if you have time to stay a little sure. bit over we have a lot Anytime of questions you want. from participants um we won't get to all of them but we'll, we'll try to get to a bunch um so but tell me about this 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 last phase or or last two phases of his career where he's back and forth from from palestine through world war ii um he's it, correct me if I'm wrong. He's he's no longer he's no longer it, as powerful or more powerful than Ben Gurion, um, and um, uh, well, well, just what happens in those last 15, 20 years of his life? Are they as as packed with events? And I would say after he. Um, after he is actually, uh, after he actually becomes president of the state of Israel, his career is pretty much over. Um, in 1930, he actually leaves of his own volition. In Zionist historiography, it says that uh, he was uh, uh, thrown out of the presidency of the Zionist movement. It's really not quite true. Uh, it was his own doing. Uh, it was part of his pride. It's, it's a long story. But, and for five years, uh, Sokolov is the president of the World Zionist Organization. Weissman comes back. But um, as soon as he recovered from this uh, ouster or departure in 1930, Weissman is already scheming how to get back in the saddle. What does he do? Um, the first thing he does is he goes and raises money in South Africa, tons of money at the time. Uh, nobody asked him to go, nobody told him to do, but nobody else is raising money and he's serious money, he goes and does it. Uh, second, uh, he gets involved in the rescue of um, uh, Central European Jews, German Jews, Austrian Jews, Czech Jews, etc. cetera. And uh, he creates a, uh, an organization. Nobody asked him to do, he doesn't ask anybody, he just does it. And um, it gives him a lot, of, uh, a lot of power, a lot of prestige, and a lot of uh, wiggle room because he raises money again. And right. he decides what's gonna happen with that money, not somebody else. So um, I think that um, we, we have to think about Weizmann until 1946. He, he comes back to, the move, to uh, run the World Zionist Organization in 1935 and he's again president till 1946. In 46 again, it's not that he's being pushed out but nobody else is being elected. Weizmann does one other thing that we haven't touched on, and I'll, I'll stop with that. And that is, I mean, you have to think about this. This is the president of the World Zionist Organization. What does he do? The uh, mandate, the mandate letter says that um, the World Zionist Organization is gonna represent the Jewish people. 
Weizmann says to himself in the 1920s, wait a minute, the Jewish people are more than the Zionists. I want a non-Zionist there too. He decides, I mean, literally he decides he's gonna create a Jewish agency. He finally gets Marshall in America to, um, to uh, work with him as the non-Zionist. And he and Marshall actually, I mean, Weizmann is the, is the engine here. And think about this, this, uh, this uh, picture. In 1929, in London, on the stage of the Opera House, I think it was the Opera House, on the stage sit all the major leaders of the Jewish people. Albert Einstein sits there, Frankfurter sits there, Weizmann, of course, uh, and on and on and on. And they create, and this is the beginning of the Jewish agency. I tell you what, this is also important because the Jewish agency creates also an office in Palestine and Weizmann decides that Ben Gurion is going to run that branch of the Jewish agency. That Jewish agency in Palestine is a major force that is also part of the creation uh, of the state. Of course, it disappears as a, as a political force after the state is established, but until then, uh, that and what Weizmann was able to do in the 1930s are major anchors for the establishment of the state of Israel. Let's go to questions and we'll, um, we'll, we'll go for at least, let's say 10 minutes. So uh, Lily Alone, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that name, last name right, Lily, wants to know a little bit more about his wife, Vera. Um, uh, I'll point to three things. There, there's, um, th they're involved in a sort of, in their early courtship, they're involved in a sort of triangle. Um, uh, she asks about her, um, whether she enjoyed her life in Palestine. And then um, what was this, what was their marriage like, really, I guess is the question. Complicated. <laughs> um, Vera was, uh, first of all, she was Weizmann's second major love. He was uh, engaged to another woman uh, prior to her. Um, Both of Sophie, them doctors, right? Sophia Getzova was, was became a physician. That's correct. Both of them were physicians. And Vera, yeah. Uh, Sophia Getzova, um, and uh, was also a major Zionist uh, uh, operator in uh, Switzerland. And uh, when he sees Vera um, at the university, he just uh, is floored by her beauty. She's different. She comes from outside the Pale of Settlement, has a different kind of education, very little Jewish education, certainly not Zionist. And they marry. Uh, she moves uh, after him uh, to, um, uh, after he moves to England, she comes to. She practices for about two years as a uh, physician and then quits. Not quite clear to me why, but she quits. And uh, uh, the marriage uh, was not a good marriage uh, in many ways. Uh, Vera was never a passionate Zionist. She did not share that. She was a passionate Weizmannist. Uh, she cared about Weizmann and she actually stood by him even when their relationship uh, or the marriage was on the rocks. Um, um, he gives her also all kinds of opportunities, but Weizmann, um, you know, early on, uh, Vera writes to him once, she says, uh, Weizmann, or Chaimchik, she called him, Chaimchik, you're going on a uh, trip to so-and-so, uh, watch your roving eye. Uh, she, she knew he, he liked, um, you know, beautiful women, um, and um, he liked women, period. He also liked men. He needed people. He needed people. Uh, desperately. Uh, Vera was uh, of a different kind. She was, uh, she did not welcome everybody uh, into the house. Uh, certainly not these, uh, you know, uh, ill behaved uh, socialists from Palestine who would come to England. She would have none of them in the house. And, um, you know, and on and on. Uh, and they actually um, uh, break up for a while. They don't, um, uh, they don't, really? uh, they don't get divorced, but they live separately for about a year. When is uh, that? In, in London. 
Uh -huh. uh, he actually moved to a hotel to the Dorchester. And uh, Vera uh, would uh, spend time with her sister in Paris or uh, elsewhere. Um, so it was not, however, as I said, Vera always stood by him. Um, Vera was, um, was a sickly woman, just like Weizmann. Uh, Weizmann, you know, half the time I think he liked to be sick or he liked to talk about sicknesses. And uh, he was a nervous wreck anyhow. And uh, he loved to talk to women about his sicknesses. It was a wonderful way to get women to uh, engage with him. And, um, uh, but Vera was also sick. Um, I've seen a pattern that when Weizmann was at the height of his power in the Zionist movement, Vera was sick. When he uh, was on the down uh, uh, trend, uh, she recovered miraculously. So, um, you know, I may be wrong. But uh, you can see this both in the letters and in the uh, in the general pattern that um, that they lived in, and uh, um, uh, so it was. Um, uh, neither of them had a had a happy marriage. Uh, Alan Luxemburg and several other people ask if Weizmann were alive today, uh, how would he assess the state of Israel? I know that's an impossible question, but maybe there's some aspect of it you can address. So now you're getting me in trouble. <laughs> um, look, Weizmann's, uh, Weizmann had an expression uh, which he repeated over and over again. And he repeated it in Hebrew. He said, Zion, uh, Palestine, the Jewish people, uh, will be judged by their uh, sense, by their uh, exercising of justice. Um, Weizmann uh, always talk, talked about uh, humanity, about uh, treating everybody uh, well. Um, uh, you know, we didn't talk about the fact that uh, it was actually his proposal in 1937 to, uh, to divide the land uh, between Jews and Arabs. Of course, uh, the Jews didn't like it and the Zionists didn't like it and the British didn't like it and the Arabs didn't like it. Nobody liked it. But um, his uh, motto was also um, not to govern, not to be in charge of, and not to be governed by anybody. We have to be free people, but we have to treat everybody else uh, well. How would he, um, how would he, uh, I think it's a complicated question. He'd be very proud, for one, of the uh, Weizmann Institute of Science. I don't think he ever imagined that it would be the kind of world leader among the 10 best institutions of its kind in the world, not just in Israel. Uh, he'd be very disappointed with the political uh, mess that Israel finds itself in. Um, speaking of political messes, Jonas Bergstein asks, um, uh, in making Weizmann uh, president, was it really just sort of sidelining him from, from all decision, putting him out to pasture? And what did he, what did he think of that? Um, true. Um, the combination though, I, I, I repeat, uh, it was Truman's not open, but, um, but unspoken understanding that Weizmann is gonna become the president. It was very important for the United States as Truman saw it at the time. But uh, you have to remember, uh, Weizmann was, he, he was truly sick much of his life, oh, he had all kinds of ailments. Um, and by 1946, 47, he was already half blind. He had problems with his eyes all his life. And, um, and um, uh, it was getting, was getting worse. Uh, you could see him in pictures when he walks uh, somebody holds his uh, arm uh, or people on both sides hold his hands. Um, so uh, that was one. And second, Ben-Gurion saw to it that Weizmann would have no power. Uh, the fact that he was in Rehovot and not in uh, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv uh, suited uh, Ben-Gurion uh, perfectly well. And, um, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, what's really interesting is that even being old, and sick. I mean, he was in his 70s, not old today, but in those days yeah. was old and, and uh, really blind. Uh, even then he was feared 
by, by people because he had this uh, aura around him as being able to do things that nobody else could. Uh, and in fact, by the way, as, as president, he traveled to the United States. Uh, actually, even before he became president, where does, where does uh, Truman uh, lodge him? Uh, in the vice president's home, what became the vice president's home. Um, and, um, and afterwards, of course, uh, he uh, is uh, 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 greeted with uh, all the pomp and circumstance that uh, Washington knows how to uh, lay out. I have a question here from a Shulamit. Um, uh, and it's a question I was actually thinking about. He grows up in a uh, Moschelic, but still traditional home. As I, I think in his early years of, of college, he's, he's even teaching in a religious school. Um, but what is, um, what is his religious life? At, at what point does he make a tradition and, and what is his relationship to tradition? And, and also, how is his Hebrew? Okay. Um, the school you, you are um, referring to is in Germany, in Funkstadt. And um, he went to the university um, nearby and he taught at this place, uh, Funkstadt, in a, um, an academy for, uh, rich, for, for, for children of rich Russians. Um, it was run as a strictly orthodox school uh, they made his life miserable, and he developed a, a very strong distaste for uh, that kind of orthodoxy. Mm. Um, he was, as I said before, a proud Jew, uh, but he uh, traveled on uh, Jewish holidays. He, I'm not sure what he did on Yom Kippur, but at least on one Yom Kippur, he was in the lab. Mm. Um, so um, uh, in terms of his Hebrew, uh, his Hebrew was okay, but not very good. Uh, he preferred not to speak in Hebrew. He knew many languages, probably uh, six or seven languages, but um, he could speak in Hebrew. Um, he didn't like it, but uh, uh, you can hear him even today on, on old uh, records. Uh, you can hear him speak in, in Hebrew, but he reads, he reads, the, uh, uh, he reads the stuff. He doesn't, he doesn't speak naturally. Mm. And um, well, let's let's just uh, let's just go with one final question. Herbert Hoffman asks, "How was it that Ben Gurion could overpower Weizmann as the Jewish leader with control over Israel?" Say it again. How does how does Ben Gurion win the rivalry? He waited him out. Um, uh, look. Uh, we shouldn't take anything away from Ben-Gurion. Uh, there's no question that after 1945-46, uh, Ben-Gurion ben is critical. Um, he seizes uh, control of the government. Uh, he, um, uh, he's really a, um, uh, a total, in total control. And uh, without him and his determination and his ability to really deploy the uh, troops such as they were, um, you know, once again, Israel wouldn't exist. Uh, so um, it wasn't very difficult after 46 to mm -hmm. sideline Weizmann. As I, as I explained, uh, he was sick. He didn't have it in him anymore to, uh, and by the way, you know, we're talking about Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the first Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Weizmann uh, uh, was in Switzerland. Uh, you know, if England was his most favorite place, Switzerland was the second one, or maybe they were equal. Um, and of course he had great love, great dedication to uh, the state of Israel, um, but uh, living there <laughs> was a different story. And, um, um, and I think that uh, people also had to choose. They had to choose, you know, being a Weizmannist, people were afraid of Ben-Gurion, uh, or are you loyal to, uh, to uh, Ben-Gurion? And when people visited in Rehovot, uh, people from the Knesset and elsewhere, they did it um, actually secretly. They did not announce the fact that they were going to go and see, um, see uh, Weizmann. I should also mention one other thing. Weizmann amongst the, the, um, the uh, uh, early Palestinian Jews 
uh, he saw as his natural successor, uh, Alozov, not, not, uh, uh, not Ben-Gurion. Alozov was his uh, chosen, he, Alozov was his kind of a guy um, and uh, with whom he could, you know, Ben-Gurion had, I think it's really very important. Ben-Gurion had zero, but zero sense of humor. Weizmann thrived on humor. You know, he would, whether it's in Yiddish or in, in uh, any other language. Uh, and he got along with Alozov. And Alozov was a highly intelligent, uh, very ambitious uh, young man. Unfortunately, he was murdered in 1933. But um, um, so um, after 46, it was, it was clear that Ben-Goyon was in control. Well, Yehuda, um... Thanks for this, uh, I was gonna say conversation, really seminar, uh, I, I would say. Um, uh, this has been, been wonderful. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I should also thank, by the way, um, the Schusterman Center at, at Brandeis University for partnering with us uh, on this conversation. And to say to everybody else, we'll be back here May 25th at seven o'clock talk with our, our mutual friend, actually, Steve Zipperstein, professor at Stanford. Uh, the title there is From, From Pogrom to Philip Roth, both of which he's, he's written about. Uh, so Yehuda, thank you again. It's always a pleasure. And um, I'll see you all next month, May 25th. In the meantime, keep reading. Thank you. Bye. Nice to be here.